Welcome to Series 26. We know it's a little bit late, but we are really excited about this one. First, though, you have to wait a little bit longer, because announcements. Mm-hmm. For some reason, uh, we're going to be plugging Courier's Call. Um, that is going to be a doing a Kickstarter to fund their production. Um, if you love campaign, uh, if you love campaign skyjacks, uh, or just stories of adventure for all ages, uh, definitely look out for that because uh, it's going to be kickstarting very, very soon. And we will be tweeting a link out to that once it is live. It's such a great show. It's, I mean, I can't say enough good things about it. My kids love it. I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as many parents know, you can't necessarily say that you enjoy all of the things that your kids are into. But if you get your kids mm -hmm. into this one, you won't regret it. <laughs> Absolutely. And can I just say that the the energy of Aaron Catano say is, oh my is God. probably the best the best energy in podcasting. It's such a good energy. It's so I mean, like you just I just smile like so big when I'm listening to it. Like it's just enjoyable. It's wholesome. It's sweet. It's uh -huh. energetic. It's oh, it's good. It's good. Uh, yeah. Do yourself a favor. There's only like five episodes out right now, so you're not that far behind. Do it. Yeah, that that show is just amazing. Get get into it if you haven't. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of things that we love, as always, we love getting reviews from you. So we do ask that you take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts or a podcatcher of your choice, and we will read it out like this one from Michael D. in Germany on iTunes. It is titled, Inspiring and Entertaining. On the one hand, Character Creation Cast is a very entertaining show that has introduced me to several gate games. Amelia and Ryan are delightful hosts who are really good at creating compelling characters. On the other hand, this podcast has been the most useful source for me to improve my skills as a player and GM, especially the episodes on Session Zero, Safety Tools, or how to use other games within, the one, within one's campaign did increase the quality and fun I had at the table. Well, thank you, Michael. That was really thank nice. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm really glad that we're helping. Yeah. One other side note I wanted to say is right now, Podchaser is doing a uh, a drive for every review and every creator uh, reply to a review. Um, they are donating 25 cents to Meals on Wheels. Oh, very um, nice. So if you go ahead and, yeah. So if you go ahead and leave some reviews for podcasts such as ours, um, you can create some money for some charity. And Absolutely. that's just pretty cool. And all you have to do is tell us how great we are. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can actually go to podchaser.charactercreationcast.com, and that'll actually take you right to our page. Um, and from there, you could you could search for your favorite podcasts and leave some good reviews and, and help some people. And make some podcast hosts feel really good. Uh-huh. Just bring some joy into lives in general. Yeah, help people emotionally. Yeah. And nourish them. It's all good. Just put put good energy out into the world. We need that. Absolutely. We need more Ryan energy in the world right now. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Well, with all of that out of the way, here's the episode. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and this episode my co-host Ryan and I are thrilled to welcome back James D'Amato of the One Shot and Campaign podcast to discuss Genesis, a setting neutral game from Fantasy Flight Games, and about his own setting for it, the world of Sphere. Yeah, welcome to Character Creation Cast, James. We're really excited you could join us again. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is, I believe, the first time I'm on Character Creation Cast. It is. True, technically, yes. Yeah, I, I got on Character Evolution Cast, which you'll let just anybody on. Uh, but I had <laughs> I mean, to really pay my dues. I really you had to pay my first, dues so. <laughs> to go. <laughs> we can't beat our first one. 
No, we did a great job with that one. What a good episode. That was a very fun episode, uh, was a lot which, of fun. which has me looking forward to what we're going to accomplish together today. <laughs> I'm excited about this. Let's start by introducing you to our audience in case they didn't listen to that episode, in which case they should blame them for that. Uh, James, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and the projects you're currently involved in? Oh, oh. Uh, so <laughs> well, this is like a three hour. It's going to break down into three episodes. Yeah. So, so well, the, first first the first one is just my plugs. The first one is just my plugs. Great. Yes. Great. 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 Uh, I'm really going to make you regret that. Uh, so <laughs> first up. Hi, I am James D'Amato. I should say hello, heroes, uh, mm-hmm. because I am the president of the One Shot Podcast Network, a network that you should be familiar with because you are currently listening to a One Shot branded podcast right now mm-hmm. um, for the past oh seven I think it's six and change years uh, I have been the host of the one shot podcast a show where we play as many different role playing games as possible uh, we will record a game in a brand new system with a new cast of players and uh, release what we recorded as hour long episodes uh, and, you know, just tear through as many different games as possible to discover the wide, wild world of RPGs. Um, We have featured at this point over a hundred games and we've just done some really cool stuff that I'm very proud of. I also happen to run the Campaign Podcast, a podcast uh, that is dedicated to long-form role-playing. Uh, so that is a sustained narrative. Rather than One Shot, which does short stories, Campaign does long stories. Uh, and what we're about to play, or the characters that we're about to build, are from the setting uh, that we use in the Campaign Podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, other things that I'm working on... <laughs> A thing In free that, time. Oh, you're really going to regret. Uh, <laughs> I have recently uh, set up pre-orders for my newest publishing project, a, a book that is an anthology of micro role-playing games. So games that are less than two pages. They're between 800 and 500 words. Uh, I have collected 40 different game designers to create 40 different small games that we're presenting in a book uh, published by Adams Media, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. So this anthology is going to be available wherever books are sold, uh, including big bookstores like Barnes & Noble, assuming bookstores are a thing in the foreseeable future, which is, you know, it's looking (laughs) a little grim (laughs) right now. Uh, But you can find it on just about any online retailer you uh, can set your heart on. Uh, You'll be able to find that by heading to bit.ly slash ultimate micro RPG uh, that'll bring up a list of all the different vendors that you could pre-order that book. Um, The next thing is upcoming on the one shot network. I will soon be producing a new show uh, where I'll also be hosting uh, that is set in the world of Tamarant uh, from the King killer Chronicles. And one thing uh, that makes this very exciting is uh, doing that with me is Patrick Rothfuss, the author of the King killer Chronicles. So if you're like me and you desperately, desperately love name of the wind and wise man's fear, but wish there were more stories from Tamarant to read, I've got good news. Uh, by the end of this year, at least, uh, you're going to be getting new stories from Temerant every other week, and that'll be on the One Shot Podcast Network. So look out for that. We, we don't know what the title of that is going to be yet, <laughs> but uh, it's going to be a good show. I can guarantee that. Um, I'm sure I have other things, but I, I can already hear Ryan and Amelia sweating. <laughs> I can hear the sweat. <laughs> no, I'm thinking, okay, so now when are you going to come back on our show and do that game? Well, yeah, um, I mean, we're designing the game for that. <laughs> I can tell you right now, <laughs> we are <laughs> in the middle of designing that game. Uh, so, you know, probably when we're further along in that process. Well, you know where to find us. <laughs> we're easy to get a hold of. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that better stay true. Uh-huh. Oh, no. Podcast <laughs> boss. 
don't know. <laughs> I'm suddenly nervous for some reason. You should be. <laughs> this this could be your quarterly review. I know, right? Oh, no. This is one of the few times there. It's very rare in a podcast situation where you have a guest on your show and it can turn into a quarterly review. But mm-hmm. you know that could happen at any time. Well, I just want to know, like at the end, like is there an official rubric that you're grading us on? Because I like letter grades, A through F. Oh, um, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so if I could have it in that yeah, format, Yeah, I can please. assure you that there is a rubric. Okay. That's all I need to know. <laughs> then I'm great. We can do it. I just need to know that there are standards. Yes. I mean, we're on this network, so eh, but. Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> F, 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 F. Oh, no. Everybody. <laughs> Press F, like, edit that out, Ryan. <laughs> I, I, I don't endorse Amelia's viewpoints on this. <laughs> uh, Ryan gets an F for not supporting. <laughs> oh, oh, no. That, that, no that's that's we how do, it works. Is we're just playing Mao at this point. <laughs> uh, we should probably make some characters just yeah. based should. on the name of the show. Absolutely. So. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get into this. And let's first start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? Okay, uh, so the, I mean, do we want to talk about the game or do we want to talk about the setting? Because yeah, let's talk a bit. Different let's talk a bit uh, about Genesis first. Uh, let's let's talk about what what is Genesis all about. So Genesis is uh, actually stands for generic system, uh, spelled G E N E S Y S. Uh, so different than the way probably most people would spell that word. Mm-hmm. Um, it is the Fantasy Flight Games uh, generic system. So it is based on Fantasy Flight's uh, Star Wars uh, narrative system. Uh, that's where it started, uh, but there's a version of it uh, for L5R. And there is Genesis, which the core rule book covers a lot of different settings that are proprietary uh, IP to Fantasy Flight games. Mm. Um, I will point out at the, at the top of this before we start talking about the merits of this system, uh, the team that designed this system is a very good team. I really like where this game ended up. I think there are a lot of really cool ideas in it. Uh, Fantasy Flight did fire the team uh, that designed this wonderful system uh, because they are currently owned by Asmodee, which is a private equity firm that buys game companies, uh, fires staff and sells them off. Or, you know, the shoe hasn't dropped on them selling uh, properties off yet, but uh, it kind of feels like that's what their MO is because that's most private equity firms. So Mm -hmm. yeah. As someone who's follows L5R very closely, not pleased about what's going on over at fantasy flight. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that, that is deeply unfortunate. And, you know, the, the thing that we kind of have to acknowledge as we go forward and talking about this Fantasy Flight product is I'm really, really not happy with the people who are currently profiting off of it because the people who worked really hard to make it are not seeing that profit. That said, uh, Genesis also has the Genesis Foundry, which is kind of a community managed content creation thing and many of the people who designed the genesis system do still post things on genesis foundry so you can if you want to support genesis content you can go directly support uh the employees that uh you know really made this game People that actually did the work. Uh, Yeah, exactly. Uh, So with all that out of the way, the way the system works, it uses polyhedral dice um, that are uh, six-sided, eight-sided, and 12-sided. They are in different colors. And basically, uh, you assess every, like, thing that you would do in the system, whether it's a combat check, whether it's a skill check, whether it is a piece of social combat, uh, you assess the difficulty of the role uh, and you compare it to your core abilities and skills. And that determines the dice pool that you create. So if you are doing something that is of average average difficulty, that would be two purple colored negative dice, which are eight sided. And they have results on them ranging from blank sides, not really affecting the role whatsoever, to uh, providing a symbol that means a failure or a symbol that means a threat. So 
a failure is straight up tells you whether you succeed or fail at the thing that you were trying to do. But Fantasy Flight has this non-binary result system uh, with threats and failure or threats and advantages, which create sort of external phenomena that could either uh, benefit or uh threaten the character who's involved in the role. For instance, if you're just trying to punch a guy, um, let's say you roll successfully on on your attempt to punch a guy, you can hit them, but if you roll threats, uh, the act of punching that guy puts you in a threatening position. So, you know, we could say that, yes, you managed to hit your target, but you rolled two threats, so a cop that is nearby saw you do that. So suddenly, even though you actually succeeded at what you were trying to do, the situation has become more interesting and complicated. That can also work for the reverse. You can fail at doing something, but still get some benefits out of it. Let's say you were trying to climb a tree. Uh, You might uh, fail to actually climb the tree, but you shake loose some coconuts in your attempt. Uh, So, you know, you roll a failure. um, That failure says that you're not climbing that tree, but the, the advantage that you roll accompanying that says a coconut falls loose. So, you know. Now you have a coconut, so good for you. Um, (laughs) Just what you always wanted. There are also, when you are uh, particularly skilled or facing particularly challenging threats, uh, there are upgraded dice that are 12-sided. The good ones have more symbols that benefit you. The bad ones have more symbols that will impede you. Mm -hmm. And each one of them has a special symbol, uh, triumphs and despairs which uh, unlike successes and failures, which cancel each other out, triumphs and despairs, if you roll them, they are always counted. So you can, and that's essentially the critical success of this system. So you can very well end up in a situation where you critic, you have a critically good thing happen, a critically bad thing happen, and still succeed or fail. Uh, which means that the actions that you perform in the system can be remarkably complicated and Mm -hmm. rewarding to kind of interpret. It takes a little bit of getting used to, especially if you're used to a binary result system like Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, But once you get the hang of it, it's really freeing and it makes the dice rolling affect play in a way that that's just more satisfying in my opinion. Yeah, I love the the mixture that you get of advantages and disadvantages and triumphs and threats and like it it really adds a lot of color to the role playing that you're doing instead of just yes, I did it, no I didn't. Yes, I did it, but no, but um I think it adds a lot of options for adding like almost your own like color commentary to the situation. Yeah. And I I will say, uh, there are points, uh, where it can be exhausting, you know, where you really just wanted to roll something to see if you succeeded or failed. And like what popped up was like three threats and you're like, I don't know, man, I was doing a perception check. Leave me alone. (laughs) I'll save them for the next turn, I guess. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) there is a mechanical, uh, system at work underneath that where, We'll learn about various derived stats and whatnot in the system, and you can use those results to really just interact with the game mechanically rather than story-wise. Typically, uh, on campaign, we're not as concerned with that, um, just because the play style of many of my players, like they care more about what's happening in the story than they do the rules of the game, uh, which is fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that varies. Uh, but I'd say overall, it is a really interesting system, especially if you like that narrative forward play, uh, mm-hmm. just because the randomization in the system is actually really robust, actually really robust and actually really very interesting. I think that's the first time I've ever understood how the dice work in that system. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We did a whole Star Wars episode. Oh, trust me, I know. I mean, have you have you gotten a chance to play? 
Yep. I have not actually. No. Yeah, I mean that's probably mm-hmm. the culprit. Is I the complaints that I've heard levied, levied against this system from you know people who haven't played it or only played it once is that the learning curve is pretty steep. Uh, it mm. takes a while for those symbols to become second nature to you. Uh, it's not intuitive in the way numbers are intuitive because yeah. we've been learning how to do basic arithmetic since we were very young. Um, but once you learn those symbols and they become such a second nature to you, it really opens up a lot of possibilities. And I actually prefer the symbol-based play to number play uh, just because I can grok, you know, symbols canceling out a lot faster than I can do most basic arithmetic. So, mm-hmm. uh, oh, and it, I think it's easier to just be like, this is successful, this is not, versus this is a 10 out of 12 successful. Well, what does that mean? And sometimes in, in some systems like D&D, it kind of means nothing. And in some systems, it means a lot. Uh mm-hmm. And, you know, it, you'll, it, it's very difficult to determine which situations you're in. And some people rule house rule that from table to table as well, which can make things more confusing. I generally speaking, really like this system and the way it works. There's a lot of rich mechanical fiddly stuff that you can get into, especially as you get into talents and things like that. Uh, but that doesn't stop you from playing. Uh, If you don't understand that, you can still play this and have a good time. And if you do understand that, you can really dig into it and enjoy yourself. Uh, It's one of those games that really tries to straddle a very difficult parallel from the people who really like story-based play and the people who really like deep mechanical power gamey stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. So now Genesis is a, you know, a genre neutral, like sort of thing where you can kind of create your own worlds and settings and stuff in there, right? Yes. So part of playing the game, uh, it sounds like you can piece together your own or jump into uh, a, a someone that already exists or uh, one that somebody else had already made it uh specifically for a specific setting like like you did with Spear, right? Yes, absolutely. So uh, this is, uh, being a generic system, uh, I have to imagine your audience is at least a little bit familiar with generic systems, but it tries to give you enough basic rules with the serial numbers filed off that you can fit it into almost any box. And whether that's, I want to, you know, play in a pre-existing IP that I'm a really big fan of. Like Mm -hmm. there are people who, you know, back when it was just the star Wars game, uh, hacked it to create mass effect. So if Mm -hmm. you're a mass effect fan, you could easily take uh, the Genesis core system and fill in the gaps to make your own Mass Effect system. Uh, you can also use like the Realms of Terranoth, which is like a big FFG property. Uh, the setting for Twilight Imperium, uh, which is another big FFG game, that is included in the Genesis Core book. So mm. if you're a big Twilight Imperium nerd and you want to play that lion that's on the front of the box or whatever (laughs) that's you can do it you can do it and the the system is designed for you to do that and to make that process easier um and that's one of the reasons that we selected this system for uh campaign and what we were doing with sphere so do you want to tell us a little bit about sphere what that is for people who idiots maybe who have not listened to the show Uh, i won't go that far um i I will say are you impoverishing yourself by not listening to the show obviously uh obviously but you know to each their own Um, i'm almost there i I, have you almost started listening i I almost started listening (laughs) what that means Um, I, yeah, I was I was kind of intimidated by uh, like how how amazing it was that I wasn't in the right mind space to like devote my attention to it. But uh, now, but now, what, are, I, what could you possibly devote your mind exactly. to? Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually uh, going to be finishing up Courier's Call uh, and, and then diving into Campaign right after that. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So Sphere for for those that don't know. Uh, 
is a setting that we designed based on the music of the Decemberists and uh, the board game that the Decemberists made in collaboration with Keith Baker, Illimat. Um, it is so, like I another way that I kind of elevator pitch it, it's like sort of a magical treasure island meets, at least the core story is a magical treasure island meets Weekend at Bernie's. Uh, <laughs> the campaign... Oh, so Muppet Treasure Island. Uh, yeah! <laughs> uh, it takes itself a little bit more seriously than that. Uh, so the core campaign is about a group of sky pirates who are on the edge of society uh, running from the Red Feather Syndicate, which is a kind of uh, Elizabethan era mega corporation that controls mm. all of the ability to fly in the world, unless you manage to steal your own ship. Uh, and so they're already in kind of hot water uh, because they're opposing the major world power, but also uh, the core cast of characters is covering up a terrible secret on the ship, which is the captain is dead. And they are using necromancy to pretend that he is still alive uh, so that they can keep sailing the ship without a mutiny taking place or some really destabilizing forces uh, making themselves known. So that is where we start in campaign. Uh, this Ryan has just understood why I'm into this show now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> the, the setting itself, there are flying ships. Uh, there are giant birds that people can ride. Uh, it is a post-calamity setting. So it's not quite post-apocalyptic. Uh, an event happened that pretty much destroyed most of the world um, and certainly most of the organized nations of the world. And what remains are... Uh, groups that have popped up in cities and towns that are now disconnected from each other on a national level. So there are lots of isolated pockets of humanity around the world that cannot get in contact because the seas are incredibly dangerous to travel. They're full of monsters and terrible storms. Uh, the seasons don't flow in order anymore. It might be winter for a week and then autumn uh, and then summer and then fall for two months. Uh, mm. It's wild and out of control and people are struggling to survive. Uh, someone discovered the technology uh, to make a substance called feather weave that when exposed to heat uh, will become lighter than air and also attempt to move away from that heat. So uh, people have used this to build skyships and the world is kind of starting to rediscover itself, but there are no formal nations. There's just this mega corporation that manufactures feather weave and kind of people who are dealing with the fact that this company is taking over the world. Uh, and so that's the, the general gist of the setting. Normally at this part, we ask what kind of things you need to play the game. And we've already covered it a little bit that Fantasy Flight has their patented weird dice. Um, <laughs> so you do need those to play this game. You generally need a copy of the core book. Um, that's really it. Yeah, there's yeah, there are two supplements for this book. There's the Realms of Tyranoth, and then there's um, the Android one. Um, a Netrunner, something with the Beanstalk. Uh, I have it on my Shadow bookshelf. Shadow of the Beanstalk. Shadow of the Beanstalk. Shadow of the Beanstalk. Beanstalk. It is, I think, based on Netrunner. So, like, yeah, yeah. Um, so I have that one too. I should be able to name it. But you have <laughs> sort of the starts of settings if you want to go and play around in those too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, unfortunately, really there is the not book. information currently available to play in Sphere beyond uh, what we released on the podcast. So if you're really hankering for some Skyjack stuff, uh, listen to the podcast and you can <laughs> kind of meander through it on your own. We do hope to create either a bespoke role-playing game or a world book at some point but for right now uh it's we're, we're keeping those cards close to our chest mm -hmm. so what kind of stories and themes then are, are we looking to explore in in this world so uh if, if you don't know decemberist music it is kind of 
melancholic, I will say. Uh, and a lot of it is based on classic folk tales. One of their most popular albums uh, is The Crane Wife, which is based on the Japanese folk tale of a man who takes kindness on a wounded crane. Uh, and then the next day, a beautiful woman arrives on his doorstep to marry him. They live happily together, but they're poor. So uh, he asks his wife to weave and she creates a beautiful, beautiful fabric uh, and he gets kind of selfish and makes her weave more and it slowly d makes her health deteriorate until he discovers that she is a crane um, and that uh, she has been harming herself in order to make this fabric and, and she flies away. Uh, so there are all sorts of different folk tales that, uh, get pulled into Decemberist music. Um, there are some based on just classic folk music. There are some based on other sort of mythology and folk tales in the latest album. Uh, they took Rus Rusalkas, which I think are Ukrainian, uh, sort of river spirits that, uh, tempt people into the water and then drown them. Uh, mm. there's a lot of music in Decemberist discography about sad sailors living difficult lives. Um, so we took that and we mashed it up with classic adventure fiction. Uh, yeah. And by that, I mean Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. We tried to capture what is the exciting essence of Treasure Island uh, and how do we make it work with uh, what we've pulled from the Decemberists. So the world itself is kind of bleak and, and melancholic in places and desperate, but you are people on an adventure. Um, and that adventure is going to lead you to wild discoveries and thrilling tense moments uh, and things like that. Uh, in many ways, Treasure Island is the core of what role-playing is. Back before we had uh, Tolkien, like the first real adventure story about people going to get treasure is Treasure Island, baby. Uh, uh <laughs> and so that, that's, that's what it is. And, and right now for Skyjacks, particularly, uh, we are talking about Corsairs, uh, people who own and operate sky ships outside the, uh, convenience of the Red Feather Syndicate. Um, so th those are the general heroes of the setting, though if you're a listener to Skyjack's Courier's Call, you know that the Swiftwell Courier Service is a privateer outfit, meaning they are uh, legal owners of their pirate ships in the law and the eyes of the Red Feather Syndicate, but they operate outside the syndicate and independent of them. Mm. So a lot of it is about people who travel on sky ships. It makes a lot of sense. We've talked a little bit about the the things that inspired you in making the setting, but what inspired you to make it to begin with? Why was this the world that you wanted to build? Oh, well, I guess to eat and live is a big one. <laughs> oh, That's like a kind of a big one. That's a true artist's inspiration. I mean, the, the, the behind the scenes thing is that uh, Star Wars campaign wrapped up and everybody uh, who was involved in Star Wars campaign who was not Cat uh, wanted to keep the show going, uh, mainly because it was a big thing for us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we love that game uh just as as players we liked each other we loved each other as friends you know we wanted to keep playing together and so we had to come up with something that we thought would be interesting to play together and the idea that johnny and jpc came up with together when they thought star wars campaign might wrap up and there might not be anything to replace it they were like sky pirates that's the idea they came <laughs> up with. And so uh, when we eventually talked to each other about it, uh, Sky Pirates sort of became like, well, my real connection to pirates is the Decemberists. I think of uh, a lot of nautical stuff is, is tied up in their music. And uh, that is like a very primal connection that, that I have to ideas of of maritime nautical stories so uh we just sort of went forward from there that's awesome so before we dive into character creation what are some of the basic terms and concepts from genesis that we're going to need to know 
uh, to, in order to actually create the characters. Of course. So uh, from Genesis, uh, things that you need to understand are, let me pull up. There we go. Uh, you need to know your attributes, your characteristics, and your skills. Uh, those are the big core things. Uh, there are also um, weapons, which I'd say the least important, and talents, which are you know, the next most important thing after skills. So your attributes are actually derived, so we'll ignore those. And actually, okay. huh, uh, you know what? Forget it. I'm starting in the wrong order. The real thing that we need to think about before all of this is <laughs> archetypes. Hmm. Archetypes uh, can be uh, what other systems would call species or race, um, uh, but it's also kind of like your general way of being. So your archetype could be something like elf or dwarf, uh, or it could be intellectual, uh, or let me pull up some of the other archetypes, uh, that there are in the world, uh, cyborg clone cat folk. Uh, so there are a lot of different archetypes that you could choose from. And that gives us some of the base characteristics for your character. Um, it will uh, determine how many build points you have uh, when you're making your character. Very nice. Uh, so the things that uh, the, I'm not sure it'll be helpful for you to go into your career before we finish talking about archetypes. So uh, let's talk about char general character concepts that uh, Ryan and Amelia have. Um, were there any ideas that you were bringing into this? Any uh, things that you desired to play before you, we even really get to talking about mechanics? Ooh. We're diving Ooh. right into let's create some people. Let's make some people. Let's make some people. So, Ryan. Yeah. Do you have any ideas of what you want to do? I didn't really have... You're the most, like, wide open here. Yeah, I, I have, like, a complete blank slate when it comes to um, Skyjacks and anything in the world of, uh, of Sphere. Uh -huh. Excellent. Well, we, uh, thankfully, because we are playing in Sphere, have a way uh, of dealing with that. Um one of the aspects that we have introduced to the system that does not really exist within the system, uh, basically is the luminaries, um, mm. which in Illimat, the luminaries are these tarot sized cards that introduce wild new game mechanics to the game as mm. you play it. Um, in the world of sphere, I sort of created tarot meanings for the luminaries so that uh, we could do neat interpretive like uh, ideas while we were playing. Uh, so if you have absolutely no idea what kind of character you want to do, I can mm -hmm. do a sailor's reading for you. Uh, basically, we'll ask you a couple questions. Uh, I will draw mm -hmm. a luminary for you. And that will will mine the information from that to help make your character. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. That sounds fun. Um, let's all do that because I, I, we love making things randomly. I, yeah, I do. I love it. Um, I had some. I looked at the list of uh, available archetypes here, and there were a little too many that I was interested in. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so then our first question uh, for you, Ryan, is do you want, uh, we're going to find out two things about your character, um, mm -hmm. and the you get to choose which things we learn. Uh, do you want to know uh, about your character's internal truth, sort of what they think about themselves, or their external truth, sort of what the world thinks about them? Uh, let's go with uh, external. External. Ooh. Okay. And do you want to know about this character's past or this character's future? Um, I want to learn about this character's uh, past. Okay. So, external. Uh, I pulled for you the river. Mm, that's very fitting. 
Uh, so the themes for the river are destruction, challenge, and separation. Uh, the river's rushing current can overwhelm the weak and strong alike. Flowing water can carve away mountains and wear stones to dust. The river can swell to a torrent capable of swallowing all things. It divides us from the rewards that we seek. Um, the divination for this is the river is unmistakably dangerous. However, the river is ultimately a barrier, something that separates one bank from another. At great risk, it can be crossed, and an equally great reward can be claimed. Some say this makes the river wicked. It calls out promising fortune and grace only to drag souls down. However, heroes are baptized in the strife of the current, and those who brave the churn emerge to find glory. Ooh. So that's one part of it. And that is an external thing that the world thinks of you before we answer that. I think finding out your, your past might uh, be illuminating. Mm -hmm. So uh, the children. Ooh, that's spooky. <laughs> the children consequence, uh, inevitability, eternity. The alternate name for this card is the angels. The children watch and see things you might not even notice. Although they, although they are not strong now, they will one day be. They will one day judge you for what they have seen. They represent a coming world that you do not control and one that cannot be stopped. The power of the children might not suggest immediate action, uh, but they are a promise that deeds, both good and bad, will be answered. Uh, the divination for this is nothing was unobserved. A reckoning is coming. Uh, so I kind of think to me, this means your character would be bringing a reckoning. Yeah. You know, you had the children in your past uh, and there is like this sense of endeavor around you. I think you might be someone who was wronged in the past and did not have power to fix it, but is sort of coming into their own power now. And everybody around you is kind of expecting you to go off and do something. I like that. I like that a lot. So based on that, is there an archetype that we could fit you into? Oh, let's see. So there, there's a lot of really good ones in here, like animalistic alien. That's pretty sweet. Mm, yes. Uh, um. Perhaps <laughs> setting appropriate. <laughs> setting appropriate is probably a lot better. Um, so like what, what sort of uh, archetypes are we, are we looking at here in uh, the world sphere? So most of the archetypes uh, that you will have access to in Sphere, unfortunately, the Genesis Emporium does not allow me to mm -hmm. create my custom setting yet. I think that's something that they wanted to do, but just uh, never got around to it. Yeah. Um, things that are human things like okay. uh, seers, uh, uh, intellectuals. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, would psionic count? Uh, no, ah, no. There, there is no. Much. There's no psionics in, in okay. sphere uh, as of Close. yet. Um, if you want to play something non-human, the non-human uh, options that we have are fallen and uh, changelings. So. Hmm. Fallen are angels uh, that have fallen to earth. Their wings have been removed and they have lost most of their angelic power. Um, uh, okay. I'm, I'm going to be a fallen. Okay, cool. Done. Oh, Decided. Yeah, that's that's lines up very well with, uh, with yeah. th those cards. That yeah, the, the angel, <laughs> literally the <laughs> angels being in your past. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Well, let's turn to Amelia before we move on. Amelia... Uh, do you have a concept or do you want a reading? I want to do a reading. This is fun. Okay. Uh, so same questions to you. Internal truth versus external truth and past versus future. I'm going to just pick the opposite of Ryan. So I'm going to go <laughs> internal and future. Nice. Okay. And, and you get to create a character too, James, if you want. Yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, I will have to do that. All right. I've got a character concept kind of that Sweet. I'll play with. Uh, so. First up, oh, your internal truth is the rake, Amelia. Ooh. Oh boy. What does it mean? Uh, you're probably not a good person. <laughs> um, oh, all right. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> 
So the rake, uh, the alternate name for this one is the wolf. Greed, appetite, cruelty, and resentment. The rake is ruled by appetite and the desire to pursue it. He is willing to do unspeakable things to see his desires fulfilled. Uh, while he can temporarily be pla- uh, be placated, he will eventually always want more. He is treated by others as a normal person, but it is a facade that conceals his bestial nature. He can be depended upon to pursue desire, but never trusted. Mm. Uh, the rake almost always suggests danger. Uh, while desire is natural, the rake makes it dark. Something base is being pursued relentlessly at the expense of other things. This is the sort of desire that hurts people and destroys beauty. So. Oh, I'm here for this. <laughs> let's find out what your future holds. Oh, holy cow. Wild. Okay. Uh, this is interesting. This turned from like a sort of dread pirate situation to perhaps a romantic comedy situation. <laughs> oh boy. As you pulled the union, uh, the union, uh, all, the alternate name being the communion, fulfillment, harmony, wholeness, and love. The union binds people and things together. This luminary draws separate things into a stronger whole capable of great of things greater than the sum of its parts. It can only act where there is desire, cooperation, and existing bonds. Magicians all respect love as an, as, uh, an incredibly powerful force, and the union is an expression of love's power. That friends, family, and lovers are never stronger than when they are in the light of the union. The union favors harmony. Uh, where there is a bond, the union grants strength. This power can be stretched beyond any distance or barrier. Souls in the thrall of the union can find strength even if they are separated by death. However, the bond must be true without selfishness or cynicism in order for this power to work. Hmm. Okay, so you know what movie I just watched recently? What's that? The Princess Bride. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I'm getting very much of a Dread Pirate Roberts situation. Uh-huh. Hmm. Interesting. Are we just making the Princess Bride right now? Yes, <laughs> we are. I don't quite know where uh, the avenging angel fits into it, but uh-huh. who knows? Well, that's just that Inigo was in Montoya. the sequel. It's not. Oh yeah, I guess that is Inigo Montoya. About it. Yeah, that is <laughs> that is exactly the case. I stand corrected. Okay. <laughs> look! Look! We're gonna ruin your game. Are you excited? <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> uh, again. No, we can't do any worse than Johnny's. Jo- yeah, Travis <laughs> Werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> Travis Werewolf. <laughs> okay. So I will draw uh, for me, and I'm just sort of randomly going to place these cards. I don't know if I'm learning about the past or future, internal or external. So it looks like I'm learning an external truth and my future. Uh, So external is the audience, which is an interesting card to pull. Um, Let me find it. Here we go. The audience, uh, also known as the spectators, action, drama, and suspense. The audience observes and judges all things. This is not a passive observation. Simply by observing, the audience changes events. Those under the auspices of the audience blend myth and reality. Real events turn into stories and songs. When people do or say things that seem larger than life, there is a chance that the audience is trying to that uh, they are trying to satisfy the audience. Uh, Everything is about to become a bit unbelievable. The people and world around you will seem like players on a stage and may even fold you into the show. Uh, So that's an external truth for me. So people kind of see my character as a larger than life mythic figure, which is really interesting. Um, I'm going to Andre the giant. Yeah, I'm. I'm learning, <laughs> I don't. I think we're sort of ru- really rubbing against the limits of uh, what could possibly be our Princess Bride narrative here. Um, the other card that I pulled is the newborn. The newborn, also known as the infant, 
Beginnings, Responsibility, and Potential. The newborn is the beginning of a journey. Unlike most of the luminaries, it does not have strong desires. It suggests that something or someone needs to give or receive care. Ultimately, uh, how that care is addressed is outside the newborn's control, as it calls uh, as it calls no power its own. The newborn could be a fresh start for one who has been brought into a world they don't understand. It could be the herald of an uh, of an era of tremendous personal responsibility, uh, with uh, which requires nurturing attention. No matter what, the newborn signals potential. Uh, with time and care, it can grow. So I kind of think my character is a mythic figure who is being tasked uh, with overseeing the well-being of another person. Mm. Um, so I might be someone who is uh, who has led a life that has uh, resulted in, in stories and songs, uh, but now I kind of have to put that aside and throw myself into caring for something uh, that is more vulnerable than me. Hmm. I like the idea that potentially there are all of these stories and songs about you, but only like half of them are true. Mm -hmm. And now you have to actually prove that you can do those things. Yeah, I'm... I'm not convinced because the thing I think ultimately, like if I'm, I'm not really a custodian of my own reputation and my own reputation yeah. isn't a new thing. It's a thing that is, right. you know, an external truth already. So mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of think it means that, uh, I, I'm more like an Obi-Wan figure. Mm -hmm. I have lived this big adventurous life, but right now in front of me is Luke Skywalker and I've got to, you know, guide him on a journey to mm. where he needs to be. Um, right. Even if it means setting all that stuff aside. Nice. So based on those, let's find some archetypes. Yeah. So I got the fallen. Uh, did you figure anything out for yourself, Amelia? Uh, no, I was really honestly too busy listening to yeah. what everyone else was doing to yeah. really... Well, I'm glad I picked mine before all the talking happened. I'm going to go with something truly wild. So let me know when you have chosen those. I think I'm going to go with the aristocrat. Cool. So you're starting from like a real position of, of privilege and power, which is mm -hmm. neat. Well, I like the idea that if if you will pursue something to the end of the earth, it would make sense that you are in a position of power. I mean, yeah, for sure. Like I, when we were sort of talking about that character, I s envisioned them as some kind of authority figure. Mm -hmm. James, what are you going to do? I am going with a ghost. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so Discuss. I'm already dead, uh, but I am living on as a spirit uh, and I am watching over someone who needs my help. Hmm. Ooh, I like this. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. 
Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like A Horror Borealis. A Horror Borealis is an actual play Monster of the Week podcast set in the 1990s in the fictional town of Revenant, Alaska, just south of the nation's least visited national park and way north of everything else. A reclusive small game hunter with a magical secret, a young anarchist librarian with a passion for conspiracy theory, and a sensible park ranger with a strong local book club following find themselves pulled together by common threads woven mysteriously into their past when monsters begin plaguing their tiny community. But they soon discover the things they're fighting run much deeper and much closer to home. Tune in for a story about identity, empathy, community, mental illness, and healing, and stay for the beloved local diner.